Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Libraries in Response, or if this is your first time, welcome. Uh, we, we always have someone new show up, and it's, it's great uh, to have you. So uh, uh, welcome. Hope you get something out of it today. Uh, this is uh, this is actually uh, uh, an icon that we use. Everybody has some kind of icon. They use their face, which is one, and this is for us is a kind of an image that that uh, well, it just seems to apply in a lot of circumstances. This is actually uh, a fire that uh, happened right here where I live on on the bay in San Francisco. Uh, that flame you see there is an island in the middle of uh well in, in marin county angel island and there was a fire there and one evening we looked out the window and that's exactly what we saw it was this blaze along the ridge line from the very peak which is on the left down to the water line on the right it just happened to be at that time this super yacht this is uh, the maltese falcon it was built by a uh, venture capitalist and he just happened to have it in the bay just that night they were doing a you know fundraiser so he brought this 200 foot long 200 foot high sailboat um this thing they have to wait for low tide to go under the golden gate bridge it's fully automated the the sails all unfurl from those lateral spars you can see lit up and it just happened to be at anchor uh, during the fire and we had uh uh, a photographer that we know, a professional photographer, would go out and, and capture this image. And uh, as a result, uh, he's given me rights to use it. So I do because it just, it tell you know, it's the, the world is on fire, but we have this extraordinary technology. I mean, you can sail this sailboat from your bedroom in Palo Alto. It's just uh, in, incredibly uh, electronic. Those, the sails all automatically unfurl, the masts rotate. It's just a phenomenal machine. But it's emblematic of you know what we can do, but yet there's this gap between what's happening and what could be happening. So here we are today, session seventy nine of libraries in in response uh, as libraries in disaster, Arizona and Vermont. Those should be in quotes, but that's the title of our session today. And we've talked about this, of course, before. Is the well, the emerging dire circumstance of uh, the effects of a uh, uh, heating atmosphere, heating oceans, creating these extraordinary uh, extreme weather events. And we'll we'll get to our two guests here momentarily. Uh, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. This is an open collaboration of uh, uh, tech innovating libraries anywhere uh, in pursuit of uh new applications and uh and new ways or better ways to provide services to more people especially connectivity which libraries do you almost uniquely at the scale they do uh providing free open access to the internet and all the world's digital information uh our host is the international federation of library associations and institutions based in the hague uh, Stephen Weiber is uh, juggling uh, sessions and meetings somewhere. Uh, I'm not quite sure where he is these days, but thank you, Stephen, for starting us up and for being our partner in this in these uh, sessions. Uh, we have a series sponsor, a new series sponsor here, IMLS, the Institute for Museum and Library Services. They've come on to help us uh, support these uh, sessions with a uh, with a grant. So very very helpful. Thank you, IMLS. So this is our kind of go-to metaphor for libraries, the Swiss Army knife of public institutions. We're kind of hitting this because we think this somewhat uh, resonates with a number of people trying to understand the modern library. It does all these different things. And in having so many capabilities and roles, it can lose a certain specific identity. I mean, books is what people think of, and then they start thinking, well, yeah, okay, digital books, and okay, yeah, well, there's other services, and, you know, the passports, and then they have equipment in there, and you know, it goes on and on and on. But this uh, Swiss Army knife metaphor seems to capture a lot of what they do, um, and the responder is uh, role is especially relevant for us today. 
uh, crises <laughs> go back to the pandemic. So we started this in, in response in, in just like a week after the pandemic was declared, we converged convened the first uh, session to ask the question, well, what's going on? I mean, really, what is this thing? It was a, uh, it's hard to remember, but if you want to go back, we have sessions recorded uh, at giglibraries.net, our website, and you can hear what people were saying at that time. So in fact, these, uh, these recordings have created a, something of a, of a history of how libraries have responded to the COVID crisis and then the other crises that have come along that are, you know, there's a long and growing list of them. Of course, this is the this is the major one. I think it shrinks the other political, social, economic, health crises substantially in terms of its uh, its impact. Uh, this is another. This is a new crisis: is uh, libraries and artificial intelligence. What does that all mean? What are the, you know? What are the what what's the impact on society and 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 on libraries? Uh, it's it's a big open question. Um, today we're going to focus on events that are hap have happened uh, as part of events that are happening generally around the world and certainly across the U.S. Uh, in Arizona, Vermont. So this chart shows the daily temperatures in Phoenix in July. The average temperature, the average temperature is 102. That doesn't mean the average high. That means the average temperature, including the nighttime of, you know, 90 or higher. And then over 110 in the daytime, that's average is 102 averages. So an um, unbelievable uh, amount of heat. Vermont drowning. I mean, just as we said, Vermont was supposed to be one of the places that's kind of tucked in in, in, a, in a kind of a sweet spot that's it's not susceptible to to hurricanes and fires and but you know it turns out that uh, these storms these new storms which uh because of the heat hold much more moisture i mean we saw that in uh in harvey in houston it just it dropped three or four feet of water in 48 hours on a city that size it just Never, this stuff kind of never happens before. Now it's kind of becoming common. It's a rough deal. So upcoming uh, topics, uh, we touched on these a little bit. We're, we're planning a, a, a special session for uh, October the 11th, which is Wednesday. It's not our normal day, which is Thursday. This is to coincide with the Internet Governance Forum, the annual gathering of, uh, of the Internet interests, so-called stakeholders. Uh, uh, Internet Governance Forum is a 13, 14-year-old organization chartered under the UN. It's actually out of the, the Secretary General's office that oversees this. A couple of thousand people show up somewhere and talk about the various elements of the Internet. Uh, since, as we all appreciate, maybe we don't, we just take it for granted how it, it just works. But no one is responsible for the Internet. No one controls it. No one manages it. No one has authority over it. It's a it's a big cooperative, a big collaborative, and there are a lot of layers, of course, to what that means. There's the transport layer, the applications, and various kinds of standards. And so this is a this is an annual gathering to talk about just all the different issues. Inclusion, of course, is one of those. We have been invited. Uh, we, the Gigabit Libraries Network, and uh, the Internet Society. Uh, to uh, stage a session called Broadband from Space on the 10th of October. And so we're going to build a, a debrief session the following day. Uh, it'll be midnight in Kyoto, but I think we can pull it off so you can find out what's happening. There, there are a number of other sessions, library-related sessions this year at IGF, which is really remarkable and, and good news that they're paying more attention to the to the role of libraries in how people are connected, how many people are connected. Uh, libraries and AI, this is, uh, we've done, well, I think four or at least four sessions on this uh, over the last two years. We'll have David Lankis return. David is now at the UTI school and has done an extraordinary post on uh, what he sees is the potential for libraries, not just you know how to cope with this technology, but how to use it in a very special and unique way that libraries, according to David, and I agree with him, 
uh, represent as uh, uh, as a key sort of social response to this technology. It's going to be really interesting. So uh, mark your calendars for that. Climate adaptation is is part of what we're talking about today. Uh, we've made this point that you know there's there's mitigation, there's adaptation. There's not a lot that an individual institution, a person, a community could do to mitigate this. We all want to be good examples, but in terms of real impact, it's going to take the major players, the giant financial institutions and the largest governments to really move this needle at all. So in the meantime, which gets later and later, all of us are, will have to adapt to these this new environment, which you know uh, is just making itself more self-evident. Uh, every day, every season. Uh, so that that part and and Joe Hillis, who has been on before with the Inter Information Technology Disaster Resource Center based in Fort Worth. This is a group everyone needs to know about. And you'll enjoy Joe when you meet him on the second. Uh, they they it's an all volunteer organization of technologists there's like two three thousand of these volunteers around the country and they just go in where there's, where there's an outage any kind of disaster knocks out the communications infrastructure they go in and help recovery uh you know uh, a school this is somebody that you want at the top of your rolodex when something happens the lights go out the communication goes down which maybe you can appreciate what that feels like if you don't have it but it's it really gets your attention. And so Joe, uh, they they just do amazing work. Uh, and he'll be back. Doug Dawson, I'm talking about federal programs. You're all, I suppose, or assume, are, are paying attention to these, the state planning. Uh, we've had a number of state uh, li library agencies on, uh, encouraging them to participate in the planning process. Uh, it's a big deal. It's a lot of money. And which way the 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 programs lean will both have major impact now and then later as uh, these programs are analyzed for continuation or finger pointing depending on how it goes uh, telehealth is is a, a popular topic and and we'll be revisiting that some states are doing some really amazing things and then the state of the states is a you know is a thread we've been doing where the the state libraries come on and talk about what they've done for the past year, what they've learned and what they're going to do later. It's been a really successful uh, thread series. So enough of all that. And so we can get to our, our program here. And I want to thank Dan and Mala for being with us today. And thank you all for being with us today. So we're going to start with Dan, uh, who's the uh, Kellogg Hubbard library director in Vermont and Dan's going to tell us how they how they've survived the 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 massive unexpected rains and flooding there in around his community so Dan welcome take us away thank you so much Don can you see my screen okay sure can wonderful um I'm Dan Groberg I'm the executive director of the Kellogg Hubbard Library in Montpelier Vermont the state capital here in Vermont. Uh, we are a nonprofit public library. We're not a municipal library, which um, ultimately plays into our, our recovery and our, our funding streams as we recover. Um, but I will I will get to that. <clears throat> um, in mid-July of 2023, as Don mentioned, um, Vermont in general, but central Vermont and Montpelier in particular, we're hit particular very hard with flooding. Um, and I'm happy to share our experience here at the library with all of you. Um, Montpelier is uh, a small town, really, even though we're the state capital, we're the smallest state capital, a population of just 8,000. Um, so that's worth uh, keeping in mind here. Um, we, the Calico Hubbard Library opened here in 1896, so we're a historic library. We have um, the historic building that you see here on the bottom left, and there was an addition built that sort of wraps around the back of the building in 2000, um, about 17,000 square feet in total. 
We serve six towns uh, in central Vermont, uh, a total population of around 17,000. Um, just to orient you a little bit to Montpelier, you'll see um, the, the little golden dome. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see my, my pointer here, but it's the Vermont State House, the Capitol building at about uh, nine o'clock on your map here. Um, and then you'll also notice that Montpelier sits at the confluence of two rivers, the Winooski River and the North Branch River. Um, and of course, you know, Montpelier, as many towns in Vermont, was built on the rivers to support industry. Um, and our historic downtown built right on the river banks, um, which you know, lovely setting. The river runs literally right through the middle of town. You'll you can see uh, sort of near the center of the screen um, on State Street that the river runs right under the street with a building on top of it, commercial building right on top of the of the bridge on top of the river. The Calic Hubbard Library is at the intersection here of School and Main Street, so we are a block sort of back from the river, um, but you know. <laughs> right right in the center of our downtown. Uh, we do have a history of flooding here in Montpelier and at the Calig Hubbard Library, um, the worst of which was in 1927. Uh, there was catastrophic flooding statewide as a result of rainfall uh, and the library flooded to five and a half feet on our first floor of the building. Um, you can see from this picture in the bottom right that uh, the first floor is up a set of stairs. So we're sort of raised up. Uh, so if you can imagine the water being five and a half feet up on that first floor, that was very catastrophic. Uh, we were actually just looking through the archives uh, and found some board minutes from 1927 and 28. And um, the, the costs to, to repair from the flooding were about $8,000. So. Uh, adjusted for inflation, that's about $120,000. You'll hear how that's changed over time, the cost of recovering from something like this. But you'll see that through most of history, uh, ice jams have been the problem. So, uh, you know, as ice breaks up in the spring uh, on the rivers, um, you know, creating sort of an artificial dam and backing up the water. Um, and then Hurricane Irene, which people have heard about as having affected Vermont greatly uh, and did cause catastrophic flooding in, in several parts of the state, but Montpelier and the Kellogg Hubbard were not hit particularly badly. So while there is this history of flooding, it's been a long time. Some of them you could describe as these sort of fluke situations because of ice jams. And as Don mentioned, Vermont has frequently been named, you know, the the best place to for climate change, you know, we have a lot of uh, climate change migrants coming to Vermont, people who are, are leaving California for the fires and hurricane states and moving here. Um, but even Vermont not immune to this kind of situation. So I'm going to take you back to Sunday, July 9th. And I'll note that it's been raining basically nonstop since mid June at this point. It's been a it was a very rainy summer. Um, the week before uh, there's heavy been heavy rainfall. So the ground is fairly saturated. But on July 9th, they're now predicting some serious flooding, 3.6 inches of rain in, here in Montpelier. Um, but again, you know, our history is with there's frequently severe thunderstorms in the summer. There are often flash flood warnings, aerial, you know, aerial flood warnings. Uh, we didn't really think too much of it at the time uh, until Monday the 10th when they started really talking about how this could be life-threatening, really catastrophic. Um, and uh, this is a alert from the city of Montpelier. We were receiving, you know, similar alerts throughout the day that they were expecting major flooding in Montpelier, which was, this was in the morning on the 10th. And that was sort of the first time that we, everyone started taking it very seriously. Um, and I'll note here that they expected the river to crest at a height of 19.8 feet. It ultimately reached 21.4 feet. Um, so even worse than they predicted. Um, 
And, you know, they said here they were expecting um, flooding in low-lying areas. We sort of finally started taking this seriously. The governor in the morning told people to be off the roads by about three in the afternoon. And we decided that we needed to close the library, uh, send our staff home and close down the building. We do have a binder of emergency protocols and we turned to our binder and there is actually a flood procedure uh, in the binder. What we learned um, is that it's inadequate. Uh, there'll definitely be some editing to do um, after this. Um, it was really uh, created around like there's sudden catastrophic flooding with people in the building and what are you supposed to do? I'm not sure what scenario causes that because we did even in this situation have several hours of warning, but um, we took all the steps in the binder and it felt uh, a little silly because by that point it still was only drizzling. Um, it hadn't really started raining significantly. Uh, one of the steps was to turn off electricity to the building. And at the time we thought that we might be causing more damage than we were protecting by shutting off the power to the building. We were um, worried about what we were doing. Uh, it talks about moving book sale books up off the floor and onto the tables. Uh, our basement had our you know fundraising book sale, as many libraries have, uh, about $30,000 a year for the library, which is um, a significant chunk of our annual fundraising. Um, and we did move uh, one shelf of books up off the floor, preparing for maybe some water to come into the basement. Ultimately, as I'll show you, the basement was full of water and our efforts were uh, unnecessary. Well, uh, not enough, I should say. Um, so Monday, the, uh, the water started rising. This is an alert from the evening uh, from the city of Montpelier. Downtown Montpelier is flooded, stay out. It's already worse than the flooding in 2011. That was Irene. And projections have been upgraded that would rival the 92 flood. That's when we had about five feet of water in the basement here at the library. And, you know, they talk about that the, the river is already at 19.8 feet, which is what they had predicted to be the worst. Uh, on the right here is a picture of Main Street in downtown Montpelier taken right in front of the fire department. Um, and looking at, um, you can see the intersection in the sort of background of State Street and Main Street, which is sort of the heart of the downtown here in Montpelier. And you can already see how high the water had gotten. Um, we woke up on Tuesday and downtown was closed. Uh, they declared an emergency and said no one can come downtown. Um, initially, they had said until noon, uh, then the water was not receding and they said, until three o'clock. The emergency services had to be evacuated and relocated. Uh, that, that fire station, like I showed you, and the police station is right behind there. And then this uh, reservoir, the Wrightsville Reservoir upstream, which was actually created after the 1927 flood, um, was, you can see how close it was to reaching the top of the capacity and spilling over, which would have caused even more flooding downtown. Um, at this point, you know, they issued alerts that they didn't know how high it might rise, that it might overflow the dam. They started evacuating people that were right along. Uh, this is on the North Branch River uh, or telling people to get up to their second floor. Um, basically, all the roads in the area were, were closed at that point, including the um, interstate highway, um, which shut down because it was flooded. So there was basically nowhere to go, no way out. Um, they were sheltering some people at the local middle school, but basically they said, if you're still in your house, get up to an upper floor and you're downtown, get up to an upper floor. There's not really anything we can do to help you. There was water rescue standing by. Um, the dam was holding um, and no change by 1.30. And then gradually the water started to recede Hopefully this video plays. This is drone footage um, of downtown Montpelier uh, taken on Wednesday morning. And what was once a street running down the middle, um, you can see the Golden Dome of the State House in the background. The river basically became the street and the street became the river. Um, completely 
flooded the entire downtown. Um, and I'll note that my wife owns a business downtown and our children's school was also closed. So, it, you know, thinking about recovering from a disaster when it's hitting you from all sides and your whole town has uh, been inundated like this is uh, the, you know, the emotional impact can't be um, overstated as well. Uh, let me see how I can get to the next slide. Sorry. There we go. Um, here's the library, um, our front lawn. Um, finally, in the late afternoon on that Wednesday, we were able to, we were permitted to come back downtown uh, to assess the damage. Uh, we could barely get into the library. Um, we had to sort of work our way through the backyards of some houses and buildings to get, even access the building. Um, you can see that's a street <laughs> uh, on both sides that's just covered in water. Um, and this was our first access to the building uh, at our side entrance, our facilities coordinator at about 3 p.m. on Tuesday, excuse me, that video was from Tuesday, um, opening the side door. And this is what he found. Water gushing out of the building. Um, that's sort of a landing between the basement and the first floor. Uh, oops. Next slide. There we go. Um, so this is uh, from up on those stairs looking down towards that landing. You can see the, the water in that doorway. And this is the front stairs. Uh, that's me there trying to look down into the basement. You can see that the water is even after it's receded some, you know, covering that first step, this is about eight steps up from the basement. We ultimately had about seven and a half feet of water uh, in the basement. You can see some of our books sale shelving here um, fallen over. This is a table with books on it. I enjoy those book sale donations on pause. I find the an irony in there because certainly they're on pause after after this situation. Um, looking through a broken window um, on the side of the building into our electrical room, full of water. Uh, the next day, we were finally able to get down the stairs, and this is still you. You can see how deep the water is still. Um, this is a video that we took walking through. The basement and you can see how devastating it was um there was actually a just to add to the horror movie effect there was a, a children's book that you know was the kind where you open it and it sang a song or made some noise and every couple minutes it would just randomly start playing playing music it was a Terrifying. <laughs> it was really um, emotional. So looking at our damage, of course, all of our book sale inventory and all the shelving, but also all of our building mechanical systems were in the basement. So we lost everything. <laughs> our elevator that had just been replaced three years ago in a capital campaign, our uh, electrical system, we had our main 600 amp um, you know, input to the building and two electrical panels, um, our security system, our fire system, our sprinkler system, hot water heater, our heating system, two oil tanks which had floated up in their containment area and fallen over and spilled oil in the oil. Uh, meeting room, our network infrastructure, uh, HVAC systems, our building control systems, everything. Here's some more pictures. You can see how we had moved books up two shelves before the flood. Um, but the volunteer response was remarkable. We had 160 volunteers show up on 12 hours notice. Spent the whole day, it was a hot, eight, maybe 85 humid day, um, hauling the books out of the basement via bucket brigade. And the books were soaking wet, 
covered in mud and silt and flood water and oil, slippery, and so heavy that you could put only like five books in a bucket before they got too heavy to carry. Um, you can see this pile. There's You can see the uh, historic part of the building and the addition here really well. And it's just a pile of books uh, out the front and the back we had. Um, there's the front of the building, pile of books and shelving. Filled that dumpster in the back twice with debris. So what did we do? We had a company come and pump out the basement. Um, there was a lot of drama because there was oil in the basement. We actually had to stop at one point. The Department of Environmental Conservation told us to stop pumping and that it, we needed to call in specialists and that it might be a week until they were available, which you can't leave water in the building for a week. So we had to make some calls and ultimately we're able to pump the building out. Uh, it took uh, almost a day to pump out the building, but we um, building off of our experience in the pandemic, sort of a silver lining of the pandemic um, shifted to curbside service. And just eight days after the flood, we were offering curbside service. We had a temporary electrical system, which was uh, a skid outside of a window with extension cords plugged in about six, you know, eight power outlets and everything running off of extension cords. But we were able to do basically everything except for people coming into the building by, uh, you know, curbside and offsite programming. And we made a public computer available on the front steps here um, and had public printing available to people um, to print their FEMA applications. People were coming in to do, coming to the library to do their um, small business administration applications. Here's a photo of one of our librarians using a headlamp to see the books in the stacks because we didn't have overhead light restored until September 11th, two months after the flood. Um, we now have a temporary electrical set up with our full power. Our network system has been rerouted so that we have uh, our internet and phones back. We switched to a VoIP system and replaced our whole phone system. The basement, um, as you can see, has been demolished uh, down to the exposed brick. We're navigating the very complicated FEMA process um, and private fundraising. We're estimating around one and a half million dollars of cost to restore the building. So compare that to the $120,000 from the 27 flood that I mentioned. Um, and we're thinking about building resilience, um, hoping to move uh, nearly all of our building systems up from the basement. Um, using impermeable materials instead of drywall or, and hopefully leaving that exposed brick because we actually think it looks lovely. Um, considering movable stacks or at the very least metal stacks instead of wood for the book sale in the basement, updating our flood procedures so that we know better how to prepare next time. Um, and then there's some more community-wide conversations going on um, about what we can do on a broader level to create a more resilient uh, community. Um, and businesses are slowly starting to reopen. I'd say maybe a quarter of the businesses downtown have reopened. So um, there are more photos and information on our website, kellogghubbard.org. And certainly if anyone is moved, uh, would love your donations. And there's a donate uh, link there. Thank you so much. Wow, Dan, uh, horrendous. <laughs> uh, but it's great that you were able to recover and and deliver services, uh, albeit ad hoc uh, from the curb and outside. But I'm sure those services were appreciated because everybody would have been in a similar situation as a library, you know, out and flooded and needing Absolutely. access. And we, so we actually circulated um, more than 20,000 books last month, which is about two thirds of our normal circulation. So if you can imagine, this is people calling or emailing or going on their, um, the online catalog, selecting books, and then our librarians having to go and pull them themselves, bring them out to the, uh, to the front lawn under that tent where we had curbside service. So it's pretty remarkable, the uh, effort that it takes, but also the commitment that our librarians have to, to serving the community and keeping those services running. That is remarkable. And you said that uh, there's a general citywide planning, probably a statewide planning process is going on now to re to evaluate, prepare. You know, these are 
these are hundred year events that have happened to you in, you know, in less than a decade. And so if you want to predict off of that, then you no, know, it's going to happen again. <clears throat> so are you involved in that community planning itself? We have been, um, and I, this is certainly a, a challenge that I've identified, you know, a lot of the people who have been affected have been so deeply involved with their own recovery that it's been hard to participate in the broader conversations. I, you know, it's basically been a full-time job on top of my normal job to be dealing with all the, you know, all the recovery and the the FEMA process. I have, you know, I've spent probably 10 hours this week on spreadsheets for, for FEMA aid. Um, so I, I haven't had the bandwidth to participate in those conversations. Okay. All right. I appreciate that. It, uh, like I mentioned to you earlier, it reminds me of the announcement on the airplane, you know, put the mask, put your mask on first before you try to help other people, because if you're incapacitated, you can't help anybody. So there's just a, a, a steps of, uh, of recovery. So Absolutely. we'll be interested in how this, how this plays out. We're going to open up for questions uh, after Mala, who we want to get to right now. Mala, thank you for coming on. Mala is a long time active uh, participant in libraries and response it's nice to have you presenting today mala uh thank you tell us what's what's been happening mean, this heat story has just been just off the charts uh incredible i'm very interested to find out how it's impacted the communities and the libraries in arizona um let me start uh by sharing my screen okay um One second. Share screen. And button there, the bottom. Here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Here we go. Okay. And yeah. as yeah, as, as it's loading, I wanted to tell you that um I attended my first IFLA in person uh conference in 1976 uh, wow. in India. And um it it's been it was an incredible journey from there to here. Forty seven years later, I'm still working in libraries and still uh, enjoying it, which is what um, you know keeps me uh, going and keeps me putting one foot in front of the other every morning. So mm -hmm. I can also relate to the Vermont experience because I grew up in Mumbai, Bombay, India where we have three months of monsoon non-stop. It doesn't let up. And Bombay is a, a coastal city. Always, um, you know, there are this flooding. And in some ways we are dealing with what, uh, um, you know, Dan was talking about. Our homes are all on the second floor now. No more uh, homes on the first floor because it's all parking. Of course, cars get damaged, but that's uh, people in homes are safe. So I, I, I totally relate to what, <laughs> to the other extreme. But let me talk about the challenges we have here in Arizona. Um, how hot does it get in Arizona? You showed us that chart that actually speaks about how hot, hot it gets. Phoenix this year broke the heat records. Um, and in Maricopa County alone, we had the seventh hottest summer in the last 129 years, 31 straight days of temperatures that were 110 degrees. Um, you know, this is an average, like you say, day and night temperatures, uh, an average of 110. Um, I, I have sent you the presentation, so of course you can, uh, you know, when you pass it on, uh, if folks are interested, they can click on that article. It has a beautiful interview with Medina Zik, who is the director of the Mustang Public Library in Scottsdale. Um, the, the article spoke about um, the extreme temperatures. We were at 122 uh, for a couple of night, couple of days. And it's almost impossible without air conditioning, you know, and sometimes because the heat is so high, the air condition gets knocked out because it's constant 
uh, working. Um, and it, it's also an interesting statistic that four of the five men, uh, four of the of five people attacked by heat stroke were men. What's with that? I have no idea, but uh, that is a statistic that uh, uh, that was recorded. Um, they also said that there was 5% more uh, in 2021 of people who had heat stroke and 70% more than in 2020. That was the year of the pandemic. So uh, there is, I've got some excerpts from uh, Medina Zik's interview here. And it's it's very interesting when she talks about, you know, she's had more than 25 years of public service. And she says, you know, in all her life at, um, you know, at the library that she was at, they, the library was open seven days a week, you know, and they people could come, sit down, cool off. Um, and especially in the summer, it was heavily used, not only by the regular folks coming in, but, but by the homeless who come mostly to charge their phones, who spend the day watching DVDs on the computer, maybe getting in touch with their loved ones uh, through the library computers using email. Um, sometimes, you know, they are make, doing um, their job applications from the library. You know, the beauty is that when you come to the library, you don't need to have an ID to use the facility. So sometimes, we have immigrants who are still waiting to get their IDs or are here illegally, but they're here and they do need to be taken care of. Um, there's also um, transportation available if they dial 211 uh, and ask for transportation. Of course, uh, they need to have a reason uh, you know, to go to the library. Maybe it is a telehealth appointment, maybe something else, maybe a job interview that they are taking you know, they have to have a valid reason and then they, they would get not just to cool off, of course, because 211 services are very heavily used. But also the library uh, puts together hygiene kits for those who need them. You know, they have little toiletry bags and they include toothbrushes, toothpaste, shampoos, combs. In fact, they take donations from folk who, you know, some of us, when we stay at the hotels, you get those small little um, disposable uh, shampoos and uh, soaps and things like that. If you collect them, the library collects them and they take those donations and they use them uh, to, to fill these little hygiene kits that uh, can be given away to people who need it. Um, and, uh, you know, the, there are, this doesn't affect only the people who are homeless or who are um, below the poverty level. It even helps, be, it even affects people who are well-to-do, who have huge homes, you know, some sometimes inherited, but they they can't run the AC continuously because their electricity bill goes up so much and they can't afford to pay those bills. So they oftentimes uh, turn off their AC and come to the library to cool off, you know. And in, in Maricopa County in 2022, they were, 339 heat-related deaths. And like I said uh, in the previous slide, there were 70% more than in 2020, which was the year of um, the pandemic. Now, what are libraries doing um, in, case, in these situations? Of course, the many of our libraries are uh, heat relief uh, stations. Uh, they are they are on the heat relief network, and I'll show you some of those in the in my next couple of slides. Uh, they have a regional partnership with the Maricopa Association of Governments, MAG, as they are known, with the municipality in that area, with nonprofit organizations and faith based organizations, and they coordinate and supply the libraries with you know, water, water dispensers, they uh, donate water bottles, uh, some, some of them in partnerships with other um, nonprofit organizations um, have food available, you know, little, um, let's say bars and stuff like that, that, that can be handed to kids that, who are there for a long time. And there is an interactive map as well as a printable uh, directory 
of where these hydration stations are. And if you see a board like that in front of the library, you know that that is a hydration station. They also have, um, you know, the, the logo that says heat relief. They're part of the heat relief network. So uh, you can see here a map of um, the Maricopa County uh, Library District. It has uh, marked on the map the different libraries that are um, hydrating there that, that, that are cooling stations or the heat relief uh, stations. And in most of these, like I mentioned, they have water fountains, bottled water available, and the, the hygiene kits um, and some snacks, of course, uh, to help them. The, they also have community outreach navigators. These, these community outreach navigators are available online even from home, you can reach them to connect-arizona.com uh, and they are they can guide you to the nearest um, heat relief stations or any other um, relief that you may require, like assistance to pay your electricity bill, assistance to pay your rent or things like that. And of course, they help with technology as well. Uh, I've listed uh, the libraries there that have um, that are all a part of uh, uh, the the heat relief um, in in Maricopa County, which is our largest county. And uh, when you get the presentation, you can click on the link uh, that actually shows Avondale Public Library has this big board sitting in its lawn, directing people to the library that says. Um, heat relief, you know, if they if they really need that relief. Um, this is an interesting story that I really wanted to share with you. Uh, John Janizek, uh, who is a librarian at Sanborn Elementary School District in Chandler, is, is, is a very um, animated uh, uh, and helpful librarian. You can see in, from the picture how he does uh, children's shows inside, inside the library, story time, puppet shows and things like that. But he also acts as the crossing guard, uh, you know, when school lets off and um, helps children uh, get to their cars and to their parents. And uh, he says, uh, you know, that when he one of these, one of those days, hot days in Phoenix, when he was helping students cross um, the street, the the school street, he suddenly realized he couldn't get his foot off the the, the sidewalk because his shoe was stuck. And you can see a picture of that <laughs> shoe there. Uh, he couldn't get back uh, without getting his uh, feet almost burnt, you know, through his feet, through the shoe, the broken shoe and the socks. He had to go back and um, get a change of uh, shoes. I don't know from where and how he managed to get home. But uh, his that was how hot the sidewalk was. And of course, he says he can no longer wear those shoes, but the experience lives with him even today. Um, what do libraries do in response to this? You know, Mojave County Library District, as well as Bukai Public Library, they had a grant from the Arizona Humanities Council, and they had a speaker session on how Arizonans survived the desert heat before air conditioning became a thing, you know, and how um, they adapted creatively the lifestyle um, how town planning was done differently. And uh, of course, uh, the speaker was uh, Reed. Uh, Ms. Reed was really uh, a humorous speaker as well. So she talked about how uh, one can survive the desert temperatures and how we can learn from the wisdom of the people who, who actually lived in those days, uh, what they ate. You know, sometimes it is. Uh, different kind of cacti that they could get um, hydrated from, you know, how they picked the thorns out of those and, and had those uh, cacti to quench their thirst. Um, she, some of those forgotten aspects of Arizona's history 
was uh, brought out during those two those sessions. And uh, they, those sessions were well attended, and it was it, it, it's it's a wonderful way to show people that they are not suffering alone. This has been Arizona's history, and uh, they need to learn to adapt to it. Um, the Coolidge Public Library uh, in Pinal County had uh, has partnerships with uh, the Parks and Rec, and they had they. Uh, have a summer reading program where at the end of it, you know, for the kids who chose to read, they give them free pool passes. Of course, they didn't exclusively give it only to those kids. Other kids also got free pool passes, but the kids who did the summer reading also could choose a book from the collection of titles on completing the reading program. They also provided a pool palooza pool party at the end of the summer bash, and uh, they they expanded it to almost the whole day event, um, and uh, they they distributed the friends of the library actually went to the local businesses, and got free coupons for ice cream cones for ice, uh, for paletas and things like that, and would give these coupons to the children. Of course, this encouraged the local businesses as well because. When a parent takes a child to buy an ice cream, of course, they, they have other children tagging along or they themselves want to have some ice cream. So it encourages local businesses and uh, they often go away, you know, not, not only are the other parents happy, but the business is happy as well. Uh, Coolidge also has a cooling station and they do get donations of water. They encourage people to take one bottle at a time, but, uh, and if they did have uh, a, a bigger budget, they said, oh, we could help them more. That's always the story of our lives, isn't it? Yavapai County Free uh, Library District actually did um, put allocate more funds into having a, a more um, robust dig digital collection, ebooks, audiobooks, research databases, et cetera, because then people can, um, can download those books from home instead of making a trip to the library, which also is okay if you have an air conditioned home and you don't have transportation to the library. They, the, uh, the library uh, district also did what is called the, the you, it's, it's a YouTube channel for story time. So uh, many of the librarians too were stuck at home with, because of the heat, they were unable to come if they had a heat stroke, but you're not uh, so um, disabled that you can't do some programming from home. So they produced these um, story time videos uh, that turned out now uh, to be a collection, a playlist of story times that you can watch anytime from home as well. And uh, they're planning to add to that collection, uh, not only of children's story time, but other, other stuff as well. Um, they had more indoor events, yoga, tai chi, knitting, tie dye, uh, you know, story times, uh, music and craft for kids. They had artist night where the artists would come and display what they did and uh, local artists and, you know, sell their goods as well. So uh, the library was very creative in the way they did things. Of course, they partnered with the food bank and the food bank donated juice boxes to kids for, for distribution to not just kids, to everyone when the temperature went above 100. Um, Sedona Public Library, of course, had an interesting viewpoint that they did not want to stock bottled water. They said that that pollutes the environment and they would prefer a water bottle filling station. They had one inside the library, one outside the library. So even if the library was closed, you know, they would leave a full um, water uh, container so that uh, and uh, paper cups so people could you know quench their thirst while when the library was closed. Um, Paula, could you uh, wrap up, please? Yes, I have. I have a couple couple more slides that I'll go through very quickly. Uh, my Prescott Public Library ha again. Uh, you know, you can read what they say about uh, coming and cooling off. But Yarnell, I wanted to to just draw your attention to this. This is where the big fire happened. And they have a, a population of 
about 600 people. They got them to come to the library during the summer and cool off and as well as read more than a thousand books, thousand and one hundred books during this time. Uh, Chino Ali had again, you know, same kind of stuff. They gave, they had water slides that they rented and got to to their parking lot, and they had um, uh, they had cooling um, tents put at, at the end of to celebrate the end of uh, the summer. Um, Yuma is very close to the border, both the Mexico border as well as California border. It gets really, really hot, and what. I know this is this is the slide you can't read what's on the slide, but I just wanted to point out that they have these posters available everywhere in the library. Who's at risk? What are the health effects of heat? And what do they have to do to prevent uh, getting dehydrated? Um, Pima County, in addition to all of those things that they do, actually take their services to the people in the multiple house, multiple um, tenant dwellings, you know, apartment buildings and those kind of places with a mobile hotspot for them to do whatever else they want to do, as well as both Pima County and I want to talk about Tuba City, they both have telehealth in their library. So you can come to the library and take an appointment with your doctor and have your blood pressure taken, have, you know, there are kits available in the library for temperatures, for pulse oximeter, there's a pulse oximeter, there is a blood pressure cuff, weigh scale, and you can actually, uh, and a camera, so you the doctor can actually see you and talk to you. You can set up an appointment, zoom in and talk to your doctor while your kids are safe in the library. <laughs> so, um, and you can actually call 211 and get a ride to the library if you need to for um, for tele appointments. So, any questions? Back to you, Don. That's excellent, Mala. Um, mm -hmm. What a story! You uh, you make some and revisit some interesting points. One, as uh, Sharon Strover echoed, the uh, the we think about sort of the physical services, the the physical layout, and so on, but people are going through uh, serious uh, events and have uh, emotional distress over these, this, pick a disaster, even down to the individual personal crisis. <clears throat> so that's another service that libraries are kind of drafted into is, you know, emotional counseling. It's, it's really extraordinary uh, kind of a role, unique role. These are not first responder roles. The first responders are, in any large event, they're just completely overwhelmed. Okay. And so mm -hmm. that's why this this idea of the second responder is really important. A shelter, uh, you made so many points about the value of that, uh, you know, for people to get out of, of the heat, to, to be hydrated. The answer is not simply just cranking up the AC. This is, <laughs> a lot of people think that is the answer to, to uh, right. planetary warming, but it is not. The 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 other point you made that I that made me I want to ask about access to the information. So there was a lot of information that's posted, digital information is posted. Yes. But if people don't have access, you know, how do they know about it? The only mm -hmm. thing I guess they can think of is to go to a library to access mm -hmm. the digital information that that mm -hmm. they need. So it's an essential role, uh, and and. Did, did you have, uh, have there been reports of increased library usage in general? Not just the people wanting to get out of the heat, but the people needing to access, uh, you know, these uh, digital public information services. Uh, there, there has been an increase ever since the pandemic, you know, of use of uh, the digital resources in our libraries. I think that is, that goes um, you know, for most libraries around the country that people have gotten used to now, um, you know, accessing the, the library electronically, which they were not able to do before. Uh, but that presupposes that uh, they um, have internet access, which is why I am here, you know, doing this. You know, it is, uh, I am the state e-rate coordinator, administrator for libraries, and I make sure that the libraries have 
uh, internet access. And now with ACP, we're trying to get internet access to homes and that so they can access the e-resources, even story time. I mean, kids are getting used to doing story time online. You know, I couldn't get a little kid to sit in front of uh, the screen for that long and listen, but uh, they are getting better at it, uh, at doing that. And like you rightly say, you know, and I forgot to mention that uh, in I did have a slide about how um, one can recover from heat heat strokes and things like that. There's a support network um, on recovering from these heat related health issues. And uh, uh, Pima County does have nurses coming into their library um, several times a month uh, to do this kind of support, you know, for people who are interested. And many of our libraries are now doing telehealth uh, similar. Uh, I think this is one of the really important services that's emerging is this telehealth uh, environment right. and library. I think it's a wonderful development. Uh, there's a question related to uh, the bookmobiles, which is a good answer to accessing digital services. Uh, did they have problems with the uh, the tires melting or anything like that? Did they have heat related? <laughs> no, not really, because I think Arizona, we are used to that kind of heat. And, uh, and um, I guess these are uh, much more resilient because they are trucks, they are vans, they are big buses, so they are much more. We didn't have any incidents, uh, but we do yeah. have antenna on top of the bookmobiles, uh, you know, to make sure that uh, uh, there's at least a thousand feet around it that that gets um, access that people can actually download ebooks or sit inside and um, you know send an email or. Yes. You know, access that email. Mm -hmm. That's great. Are, uh, those are uh, e-rateable, right? The, yes, the they are. Yes, yes, they are. That's great. They are. Um, mm -hmm. Let's. We need to wrap up here. I'm going to go back to Dan and ask Dan for kind of any closing remarks, some advice you might give to. I mean, we we've, we've touched on two stories there, but there are uh, there are dozens of these stories because there's so many different places that have experienced disasters in the last few years. Uh, but what what would you advise, uh, Dan, for for others in terms of uh, you know, preparation and response? Yes, um, good question. I'd say you can never be too prepared would be one thing, as evidence from the fact that our emergency procedures were insufficient. Um, you never know what could happen tomorrow, and it doesn't hurt to be overprepared. The other thing I'd say is just, you know, be flexible. I think we're used to that as libraries, but um, can't be overstated. You know, the just accommodating every way to serve our community, whatever that looks like. And I think the pandemic has taught us some lessons on that. And I think that's something to keep in mind. Um, and the last thing is just like stay positive um, because it can be overwhelming. Um, but, you know, if you, if you don't laugh, you cry. I think I said that many times um, over the first week or two. Um, it's, it's been great to have a really, um, a really positive, fun team that is going through this together. And we've, I, I didn't mention that I started working at the library just uh, two and a half weeks before the flood um, as oh. a director here. Um, so it was a brand new job for me. So certainly um, relying on partners and the expertise of the people around you is important. Well, um, that, that, that flexibility is a key key point. And uh, Mala touched on a whole bunch of what sound like adaptation strategies. And humans, if nothing else, are adaptable, highly adaptable. And we're going to need to be, of course. But I wonder if it doesn't work against us, you know, that we just we can adapt to anything. And so we'll just make the most out of, you know, whatever circumstance, keep a positive attitude. Uh, I mean, yeah, uh, but action uh, to uh, help communities respond and participate in the, in the policy changes that have to happen or is a key thing. Mala, uh, last words, advice for our um, participants today and for anybody that will watch it later on. You're muted.
There we go. Okay. <laughs> I think my my key takeaway from this is nurture those partnerships. You know, we can't do it alone. We need those partnerships and collaborations, the food banks, the, the uh, you know, transportation folks, and many other um, hidden uh, services that really help us uh, at the at the time of disaster, we cannot start building those partnerships during the time of disaster. Yeah. We can we have to build those partnerships and collaborations ahead of time, and you know at the, it it serves us so well during the time of disaster. That's my my takeaway from this. That's a that's a great one. It's it. It, it's like the the investment curve that people have related to disaster. It's like, right. yes, we need to do that. It's a great idea. It's just today I've got I've got 15 fires I have to put out. We'll get to that, but just not today. Yeah. And then of course it happens, and the and then it's, it totally changes. Whatever it costs, we need help right now. You know, the blank yes. check comes. Out. And then afterwards, it kind of tapers off depending on how much was learned, either rapidly or, or slowly. Uh, but it's just that curve that is, is zero and it goes up to as high as possible that it kind of tapers off. But uh, uh, pre preparation is clearly uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, the, the old ounce of uh, prevention uh, right. uh, saw. And so this is, this these are just two detailed stories, but it's easy to imagine there are many more and we'll be covering some of these, of course, uh, and and hope that these two stories have inspired you, have uh, relieved you, have frightened you. Whatever the response you feel like would benefit you and your library or your community, uh, I, I think we got some really good uh, information and examples today of resilient libraries and making their communities more resilient. So. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Mala, for uh, sharing with us today. Thank everybody for coming. Uh, we're going to close the recording here. We'll hang out a little bit. I'm going to close it. And thank everyone.